Well, thank you everyone for coming to my talk about updating Darwinian evolution, part one. And this one is going to focus on some of the modern ways that evolutionary biologists construct and add to the theory. And that is primarily from the wonderful technology of DNA sequencing, uh, population genetics, and some molecular biology, where we learn about what genes actually do and where we can compare genomes. My name is Stephen Gazier. I'm a PhD in molecular biology, and I used to teach uh, college biology for about eight years. I am reformed in that I'm back to doing research in the private sector uh, related to uh, genetic engineering. So one thing about today's talk, and you are welcome to watch this, is that I am primarily constructing and bringing you updates from a particular documentary. And this is What Darwin Never Knew, which was broadcast by PBS in uh, 2009, which corresponded with the 150th anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species. And it was based on uh, books by a very, uh, just incredibly uh, eloquent guy in the field named Sean Carroll. And he has written uh, a slew of books, but these were mostly based on Endless Forms, Most Beautiful, and The Making of the Fittest. And these are books that are, again, in the, in the, in the vein of Stephen Jay Gould, trying to bring complicated topics to a wider non-scientific audience. And they are very nicely written, they're very eloquent. Uh, my first book that I read by him was Remarkable Creatures, which is also one I would recommend reading. So again, I will have a lot of slides and screen captures from the video. And what I will be doing is trying to provide, from my biology perspective, a shortened update of the video and to provide some degree of information that the video uh, glossed over and to provide some more of the resources that went into the science that they present. So with that, again, I'm not assuming you've watched the video for this, but if you have, we'll have some time at the end where maybe we can have a more advanced discussion about some of the particular items they presented. Okay, so I am not going to give a long coverage of what Darwinian evolution was. I am going to just primarily remind you of the theory that, again, he generated from observations. And there were two main parts when it comes to natural selection, which is that one on the left-hand side, organisms within a species vary in their genes. Again, there's variability. If you look around your fellow humans, you'll see this variation from kind of a common form and common theme. And also, uh, when, when you think about the population of any species, that the reproductive capacity always hits the limits of the environment. That, for example, we cannot fit a trillion people on the earth. The, the actual physical constraints and food constraints uh, would limit that. And there's also things like predation and disease that remove individuals from the population. And so his th synthesis of these two ideas was that the best reproducers within any sort of population, and on the basis that a lot of times they're the best reproducers because their genes, their variations reflect some better fitness to those environments or conditions, that they will then have more offspring. And that will actually change the amount of those specific better genes within a population. And over time, those accumulate, and those can lead to, again, evolutionary changes. Again, the other major part of the Darwinian evolution is this idea of identity by descent, that the genes you have are based upon the genes you inherited from your parentage. Now, one of the key things in thinking about this origin of species and one way of representing this idea was this tree of life, and that you have um, branches that as species vary, 
And these variations build up because of, again, those selective pressures, those genes that make some individuals better than others. They also can diverge enough that they become separate species. Again, the variations pile up that if you are a bird species that prefers to mate with um, birds that have pink uh, coloration, but then some individuals are becoming less pink, then you also start to diverge as a species and, and interact less. And again, over long periods of time, this is the origin of species. And that if you go back far enough in time, that there will be this one common ancestor that represents all of the species, or that represents the progenitor to, again, all the life that we have on the planet. Again, I should point out that Darwin and Darwinian evolution does not make any predictions or theories about what that original origin of, of life was. That is a separate, uh, I'd say, branch of science in a sense. Okay, so I will say the first 45 minutes of what Darwin never knew does a very nice job of describing what Darwin did know, right? So to cover what Darwin didn't know, they do cover what Darwin presented and some of the basis for how he made these arguments. And there are a lot of them. Now, actually, let me, take, let me do a quick survey. How many people here have actually read On the Origin of Species? Just say yes in local chat if you actually have, have read it or even a Cliff Notes version of it. So I have, I have one and a half yeses so far, uh, one and three fourths yeses so far. The thing I will actually uh, impart upon you or try and impress you with is that it's very readable. And if you're a scientist like myself, then you will read it and actually really start to get an insight to this thought process, but then also just start to naturally understand how he was so correct about things, and it's based on what we know now, that so much of what we know now is still um, reflected and could have been predicted by what he was saying. But it is very readable, and I would recommend that if you have a chance, uh, you know, skim some of the major chapters. And uh, hold on a second, because I'm going to tell my cat to be quiet. All right. Um, so I, I would recommend reading it. But uh, again, if you actually wanted to read stuff by, say, uh, uh, modern writers, like some of the people that I'll be talking about in here, that would actually be good too. All right. Uh, one now, so one of the examples that they had in the in the documentary is this idea that when Darwin was examining embryos of very disparate species, that uh, you see this very common structural form early in embryogenesis, and yet over time, by the time whatever sort of gestation period an organism would have, they look dramatically different. And so I think, again, so the, the one that's top middle, that is human, and I have to admit that I tried to find where the answer key was for this, and I don't know, but I think the top left one is a bird. I think you're starting to see that beak come out. And I'm pretty sure that one of these is some sort of lizard. And <coughs> what this, yeah, and so that they talk about ontology recapitulates phylogeny. And I think that there's, uh, as a basis for understanding how, again, organisms develop, that is as a, a fairly nice way of describing this. Um, well, Vic, yeah, if you say it's, there's a turtle and chick in there, I will agree with you. I am not an embryologist, although I do recognize the human. Again, one thing you can recognize is that its cranial um, capacity has clearly in large proportion to the rest, and that would be one of the unique features that we will talk about later. Now, one of the other things that struck Darwin, and one of the arguments he had to try and address from the pre-Darwinian evolutionary biologists is the idea that creatures were specifically designed and optimally made to fit their environment. And one of the things that was very um, hard to explain with that type of model of how organisms exist is the fact that when you look at embryos for various species, you see these forms and structures that don't have anything to do with the adult. And so the examples of tiny bumps and snake embryos that represent what would be legs in organisms, 
but then you know adult snakes don't have legs or that um in if you look at whale embryos that you look at these embryos that have teeth and yet the adult whale uh, does not have teeth uh, and another kind of nice example is that if you look at the human embryo you see these gill slits that represent again exactly the right placement of where you see gills in adult fish as well as uh, fish embryos but those actually migrate and become the bones of the inner ear and so these ideas that you have these structures that are not ultimately contributing to the adult form of the animal is something that does not make sense from a design perspective and yet makes perfect sense that if what you have is a common ancestor a common templated body design that then undergoes uh, kind of a, a sloppy design process which is oh this was something that's useful for a progenitor organism again like teeth in a whale again the teeth would represent the whale's ancestor that used to try and you know eat uh, uh, water side animals and so you still have this programming for teeth and yet in what seems like a very inefficient process you just you start making teeth but then you get rid of them by the time you're an adult and so this type of uh, developmental programming that seems kind of sloppy does make perfect sense when you think that there must have been or that the way embryogenesis works and that the way you can get variation within species is changing this, this developmental program okay and this is a video or sorry this is a, an image capture I took from the video which is where they very cleverly took this idea of Darwin's uh, tree of life and basically turned it into a 3d model structure and again the videography is really neat where they will run along the path and show the different divisions but I think what's important is to, to idea here is that when you think about the the body patterning and the divisions within organisms of the animal kingdom that the most sensible explanation of what you see both as adults and embryos is this idea of a common ancestor that had some sort of ancestral body plan so uh, again yeah so Barragon I know you just came in we're talking about ontology recapitulates phylogeny which uh, again is not an entirely subscribed to way of thinking about things in a modern perspective but it's actually a very nice way to say that yeah if you look at how things develop you can see uh, how that reflects the various uh, um, ancestry of the organism you're looking at all right so now I want to jump into again from this basis again a lot of things that Darwin used to develop this theory and I'm not going to go into this because I want to stay a little more focused on the, the new developments that the documentary talks about in the field of science that really come back to this idea of as organisms develop you can make relatively small changes in the, the genetic patterning that lead to very large differences in what the phenotypes of, a, of an adult is okay so this is one great example I love this one and this is coat color evolution in mice and uh, this is research looking at what's known as the rock pocket mouse and I'm not going to try and pronounce the Latin name and what it reflects is that in the southern United States and there are examples of this all over the world so this is just one that's very nice where there's well-known genetics that you have this mouse that is food and as the video said the Snickers bar of the desert and so again if you are prey then your strategies usually are to try and hide or have camouflage or just you know just blend into your environment so that predators don't get you and of course predators evolve to get better at spotting you uh, so that's the part of the race now volcanic activity has changed the landscape and that reflects both the, the very sandy areas and then much darker coated areas that you see in the picture and this is a problem if you are a light brown mouse to actually venture into the darker areas uh, from the volcanic activity because it actually leads to situations like this and again this is a very graphic representation of what happens when you are at a disadvantage for avoiding predation again this is uh, where an example and this is something that the video doesn't go into this is that people have measured the rate at which owls can recognize miscolored mice 
on these environments, that they actually do have a predation advantage when they can actually see this. And uh, I think that this is, you know, highlights the type of thinking that Darwin had in mind of, oh, you have some you have variation with the population and there are individuals that survive better than others. So again, the natural course of events is that, uh, and what people have observed is that there are these darker colored mice that exist in the population. And the question for us from a modern sense of view is, what is the genetic basis for this change? Right, so we've clearly established there's a, a usefulness to this color change. There is a, um, an environmental situation that shows that this is a useful adaptation. Okay, so what the video goes into is talks about the work of a Michael Nachman, who is currently at UC Berkeley. And what they did was they sequenced, uh, they sequenced and, and examined the mouse genome. And they looked for, I'm oh, sorry, I should say the mouse genome was relatively well sequenced, but it was, I think, the first mammalian sequence fully finished uh, after the human genome was done. And, sorry, I need to cough. And they actually found the specific genetic changes that relates to this color change. This is something in the melanocortin 1 receptor gene. And it's, a well, it's been well established that in uh, several species that you make this receptor overactive that leads to a dominant phenotype where as you're laying down the pattern of hair follicles and the, these hair pigmentation bands that it turns them dark. And so again, one thing to, to point out that they didn't mention very explicitly in the video is that this change the coat color, something where if you pattern something at a very specific time in development, then that's where you get the collection of cells that impart the darker color. Now, uh, Syzygy mentioned in local chat, and something that I'm going to also briefly mention, is that the forerunner to understanding these types of adaptations, and this is not covered in what Darwin never knew, does have to do with the British peppered moth. And this was an example where way back in the mid-1800s, there was an observation that um, these darker morphs, the Carbonaria morphs, were suddenly popping up. And something that Henry Kettlewell uh, characterized, and again, I have one publication from Heredity, I think in 1963, showing that if you, if you actually measure the frequency of these moths looking at the English countryside, it corresponds that the darker moths are more prevalent in the more polluted areas, and the more lightly covered moths, or the, the more peppered moths, are more prevalent in the less polluted areas. So again, a very classic example of how um, there is a change in environment, and this uh, melanism phenotype corresponds with a selective advantage. And again, this is something that I think a lot of times current scientists and science popularizers don't talk about this, because this is an example of research that was strongly attacked by people who are critics of evolutionary theory. And so it's one that becomes ultimately a horribly controversial um, conversation to get into sometimes. And what I want to um, point out, though, is that this is a great example, and you can find lots of exercises online, but I and uh, Kira Komaroff, uh, her, she just went offline, but she is in the audience, we co-developed a population genetic simulator that you can actually try and practice this, um, uh, this, these observations that were made for looking at the change in time, where you can actually change the environment to a dark background, a light background, and actually manually measure the rate at which moths uh, come and go back. So uh, there's one at the Northern Virginia campus that Dodge Freebeards is mentioning, and also one at Genome Island. Uh, but for right now, we've also set one up at Science Center, or sorry, yeah, at the Science Circle, which is um, on the grounds, and Chantel can, or I can give you a landmark for where that's located. All right. So back to what Darwin never knew. This is another great example where um, 
wing spot evolution. And again, I want to point out that in the previous example, the mutation that occurred, a couple of small point mutations, was in an actual gene that codes for, uh, again, something directly involved in the pathway and a part of a protein that's involved. And so um, what we have in wing spot evolution, and this was, again, an example from the lab of Sean Carroll, who was at University of Michigan Madison and is actually vice president for education outreach at HHMI. Uh, and again, the pop, they were, they demonstrated that there are these spots that are in different species, all the close related species of fruit fly. And that interestingly, although they don't go into this very much, they also have different mating patterns and behaviors in terms of the amount of dance and complexity of dance. But the key thing is that these wing spots seem to be a distinct difference in the ability to mate and attract a mate in the one species on the right. And as they went through and tried to find the sequence, again, much like the rock pocket mouse, what is the gene that maybe makes the pigment? They could not find it. And so as they kept sequencing and looking, what they actually found and what they've, what is coined in the video as a switch is something that controls whether the gene is on or off. And again, for people who are uh, microbiologists, these are things that are known as transcriptional activators or enhancers that actually change the expression timing or levels or tissue specificity of genes. So not something that codes for the protein, but something that tells it to turn on or off, hence, you know, the name switch. Uh, oh, there's a little bit of a typo. I'm, I left over the, the gene name for the last time. Now, what was interesting and what they talked about is how do you actually prove that this is important? And this is something that, you know, Darwin could not do, which is to take the one variation of the gene, of the switch, that is in the one species, basically take that DNA, concentrate it into a needle, and put it driving the expression of, a, of, that, of that pigmentation gene and inject it into the cells of another fly. Right, so again, this is the classic way that microbiologists try and prove something does what you think it does, which is to actually basically put it into a situation that's not normally present, and then find some way to monitor its expression. So, uh, yeah, they mentioned that they talk about a jellyfish gene, which is, again, green fluorescent protein. Uh, that's a wonderful marker for looking at where something's being expressed. And... Uh, and I think I, and I think that this was just an important demonstration of the idea of a switch. And again, we now know it's something known as a cis regulatory element of the yellow pigmentation gene. And it's a again, it's a switch that's involved in the patterning and the timing of um, of pigmentation genes in a wide variety of organisms as we sequence more and more of them. Okay, so next they actually moved to another organism, a very popular model organism as well, the stickleback. And so sticklebacks, again, represent prey. They represent food for larger fish. And they have a particularly neat adaptation to not be eaten. And again, I don't have a way to, to represent this visually, but you'll, you can go back and see it in the, uh, the original video, that they have these little thin spines right? And that's the, the reddish white thing sticking out from the one on the left. And what that does is when a mouth, when a, another larger fish tries to engulf it, those spines actually stick into its mouth so that you can't, so that the predator fish can't finish swallowing. And then the stickleback can get back out. So again, a very powerful and useful for survival mechanism. However, there are populations of stickleback that have found themselves inside small inland ponds or other, um, small freshwater lakes that do not have that same degree of predation. And so naturally over time, they do not make those, those structures. Again, it's not necessarily advantageous to make it. Uh, again, what uh, the work that they're citing is from a David Kingsley, who is at Stanford and also Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And what they discovered is that it's a gene called PIT X1, which is a transcription factor, again, something that is a switch that controls the expression of other genes. 
that is critical for hind limb identity and outgrowth. And the comparison they make in what Darwin never knew is to the manatee. And so what uh, he published, and this is kind of an int interesting little study, is that if you look at the underbelly of the sticklebacks that have lost these spines, you can actually see remnants of vestigial little structures that represent those, but that also they are asymmetric. That there's this asymmetry to how much they decreased in size. And the comparison that they published in the PNAS in 2006 is that if you look at manatees, which again are an example of a highly different um, diverged organism, again, a mammal, a sea mammal, that you see the same odd asymmetry in the reduction of their hind limbs. Hind limbs. If you look at their pelvis comparisons, one, the right is larger than the left. And so um, th their argument was, oh, this may be some sort of recapitulated example that, again, across very deep phylogeny, you saw, see the same gene involved in this. Uh, so I went through reading through that paper, and uh, one of the, the pieces of work that they cite is a really interesting one where in mice, laboratory mice, they knocked out the PIT-X1 gene entirely and then examined the developing embryos. And what they noticed also, and again, this is from my molecular biology perspective, a nice way to understand these processes, is that if you knock this PIT-X1 gene out, so it's not being expressed, it's not available, that you see larger decreases in the right side of the organism as compared to the left side of the organism. And uh, what you see in letter B, that is the femur. And you'll notice that on the top, the right femur is the same size if you're a normal mouse. But if you're missing this gene, then the left femur is bigger than the right femur. And in letter C, you're looking at the right hand versus the left fore, sorry, not hand, forepaw, the, the right forepaw versus the left forepaw, that the left forepaw still has all five fingers, but the right forepaw is actually missing one. So again, a, a, an asymmetric reduction. And then also uh, looking at just this uh, pelvic and leg structure that uh, in letter D, you can see the pit X null is, has a much smaller right leg than left leg. So again, a nice recapitulation looking across multiple phylogenies of this, of this process. Again, a gene candidate that one, a few simple changes in the sequence of something that controls expression can help contribute to a large morphological change, like you see in the manatee, something that is a land-dwelling mammal, but then actually adapts to being uh, a fully sea-dwelling animal. And so I see a lot of stuff in the local chat, and I just, I do want to address a couple of the points that are coming up here, which is that, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the random variation you have in genetics is something that can be acted upon a selective process that as it gets more prevalent and more and s distinctly useful within that organism, that's where the prevalence come from. But the, the argument and the evolutionary theory says that a lot of these changes that are occurring are random within a population. And then you have to hope there's an advantageous component to it where then you select individuals leading to, to natural selection and speciation. Okay. So, um, and let me go back to this. Uh, well, uh, yeah, no, I, I think maybe let's try, remember some of this conversation and we can maybe cover it at the end because uh, timing. Okay, so that was a wonderful example. Another one that the, um, what Darwin Never Knew covers is beak evolution in Darwin's finches. And again, if you are anywhere in the biology field, anytime you can hearken an example back to a classic, uh, that's what you wanna do. And I won't go through, um, I, I did go back and look up some of the, the work from this, but it was worked by Arhat Abzanoff as well as Cliff Tabin. And Cliff Tabin was the one that got interviewed in the, in the video, is that, Darwin was really struck by, although completely missed the point on the birds on the island, and he didn't keep very good track of them, because he noticed that they were very different from each other. And he actually completely missed the fact that they actually were all finches. He had thought there were several different colonizations of the different islands 
from different taxa. But it wasn't until he had the, his bird specimens examined by a man by the name of uh, Robert Gould, who was an ornithologist. He said, you know, these are all variations of finches. And then, unfortunately, it's too late for Darwin to go back and take more notes and more samples. Um, I, I got a cough again. So what we have now gone back and examined these finches, and this is a wonderful example where the variation in the finches, because they are very similar organisms uh, and originally had very similar food sources, is that they had different beak morphology in order to take advantage of different types of food sources on the, plant, on, on the islands. So some would eat fruits, so they wouldn't need very strong beaks. Some would eat ground nuts, so they would need very strong beaks. And so uh, this beak morphology represents a divergence and trying to take advantage of different food sources. Again, an environmentally limiting factor for reproduction, um, especially in a, in a relatively small environment. So um, what they showed is that changes in the timing, again, a day five versus a day six expression, of a gene known as BMP4 makes a difference between how strong and the timing and the size morphology of the beaks in the developing embryo. That, again, the, if you get the early expression, you're getting a much stronger beak that's thicker and able to crush nuts, whereas on the left-hand side, you get a thinner beak that's actually more adapted for, again, finding and eating uh, softer food. Okay. Um, let me go through. So yeah, there's a little bit of a conversation in, in the discussion. Again, I, I want to point out that you know this variation that occurs is not in some way saying, oh, we're going to make a genetic change because we know it will help us find a new food source, or we will make a genetic change in this gene because we know it can be useful for avoiding owl predation. This, there's random variation that occurs in genes, again, through replication errors, um, through other sources I'll talk about. And then those happen to be useful within some individuals. All right, so another example from, uh, the, the, from what Darwin never knew is leg evolution in ancient fish. And so this is a great story where um, Neil Shubin, who was a researcher at U of Chicago and the Field Museum, he, um, was thinking, he very rationally thought, let's see if we can find one of these intermediate fossils, one of these missing links. And he said, well, this is around the time, again, 375 million years ago, where uh, four-legged animals have appeared in the fossil record. So let's go find something. Let's see if we can find an earliest example of something that is based on the seashore. And so... Uh, they went on an expedition looking for it specifically, and they found tiktaalik, which is a term meaning fresh, or uh, I think fresh fish. And if you look at the bone structure of its fins, which I have here on the bottom right-hand side, is um, something that we'll talk about in the next slide, but it's this example of a limb structure that has a lot of similarity to all tetrapods that exist on the planet today. And again, one thing I will recommend also is that Neil Shubin has also, like Sean Carroll, become a little bit more uh, media savvy. And PBS did an entire four or six episode series called Finding Your Inner Fish. And again, Neil Shubin is also someone who's written several books that, um, again, talk about evolution and examples, uh, again, focusing on tiktaalik. And what the data, what the, what the video goes through is this idea that of hox genes. And Hox genes are ones that seem to control the timing and developmental programming in a wide variety of organisms. And so the examples they talk about is we looked at some variations of the Hox expression is that they found in, again, the left-hand side is the fin of what's called a paddlefish and something that, again, is technically a more, has a, has a, a more ancient fish lineage than tiktaalik. And so this represents fish, but something that has some bone structure that's similar to what we know in tetrapods. And when they look at the timing of expression of these, they see that it's expressed in this one, for, in this one bone, and that you can see the same expression level in the human arm and other, uh, and other mammals. 
And then the there's a, a second Hox gene that gets expressed in these other limbs of the developing fish fin. And then you can also see that these are some uh, as, as a patterning expression is a a patterned expression level that you also see in the forelimb of the human arm. And so this, the, uh, again, the, the idea of these Hox genes is that they broadly control patterning of limb developments and that making changes in the timing and the amount of expression you get, you can actually help develop different forelimbs because you're proportionally changing the links and structures as they relate to each other. Uh, Again, I'll just point out that HOX stands for homeobox genes and are, again, a, a widely uh, studied and exciting family of genes in current, mod, uh, current embryology. All right. So, again, taking this further, think about embryo development and limb development uh, is the, the evolution of the hand in humans. And uh, Jim Newman gave, of course, a great example of that uh, you know, even though we can think of all the amazing things we can do with having a thumb and having this grippy hand, that of course the best example that we want to talk about is baseball. That the ability to throw a ball uh, is is the pinnacle of say human development and achievement. And the work that he did uh, was to basically take a look at the expression patterning of a gene that has undergone a lot of mutations. So this, sorry, I shouldn't say gene, a sequence known as human accelerated conserved non-coding sequence. So again, this is an example. It's not making a protein. It's just something that uh, controls the expression of proteins involved in other stuff. And so uh, when you look at the expression pattern in the, again, this is linking up this sequence to something known as LACZ. And so any of this blue coloration that you see in these mouse embryos is an example of how of how, when, and where that is being expressed, where it's, it's driving the expression of genes. And again, looking at the actual paper, what they did was they compared this HCNS1 from humans and compared it to chimpanzee and macaque. And they saw a very broadly similar expression patterns in mice, these three different examples you see on the left, but it was only the human one that led to a high level of expression in the digit. Again, the, the extended part of the hand as it was developing. That's what's showing, shown there on the bottom right-hand side. And so, again, this example of, you know, the power of what our hands do could be related to just the specific timing and overexpression of certain genes at, to, to make what is a dramatic and huge change in what we can do as an adult organism. And then the last example that the, oh, sorry, there are two more examples that had to do with uh, basically brain development in humans. And so uh, Hansel Stedman at the Perlman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania uh, was, was just someone interested in muscle development in, um, in humans. Again, he's actually someone who works with muscular dystrophy and other types of, he's actually a surgeon working in, these, in this type of area. And they were as this human genome sequence was coming out, they were looking at the muscle genes and they noticed that in humans, as compared to chimpanzees and other primates, that there was a defective muscle development gene. And again, this was one that's actually a, a myosin gene that um, makes muscles weaker, right? And so when you at first hand think about these types of genetic changes, why would weakening a muscle possibly be useful. And again, this is an important insight is that the, the muscles that this seemed to affect the most would be the jaw, the jaw muscles. And so if you look at the comparative uh, cranial structures on the right hand picture, looking at the human versus the chimpanzee, at the same time that you are decreasing the strength of the jaw, you're also seeing the evolution of a larger cranium. And a part of why this larger cranium develops is that our bone sutures, again, if you, think, if you ever think about a skull and think about the little lines that separate the different plates of the brain, the brain, sorry, the brain cap, that these, these things don't fully finish closing until your late teens, early 20s. And in fact, uh, again, anybody who's 
had been around a baby, they tell you don't, you know, don't press your finger into the soft spot. Of course, they always tell you to at least touch it to feel a soft spot in the head. That's, there's an actual hole there. Now, the the comparison being made is that if you need a very strong jaw muscle, you need to anchor that to a fully sutured up and finished brain structure, brain case. Now, if you have a still developing brain case, you cannot at the same time have a strong jaw muscle because that's what anchors the one end of the muscle. And if you, again, in the paper, if you look at the timing of this mutation, this preceded the corresponding increase in uh, brain cavity size that one sees in the fossil record. So the argument that Stedman made, and again, I think this is still very controversial. I don't know that someone has actually gone back to try and recapitulate this in a molecular biology way, uh, which of course might be difficult, is that you needed to change the structure of a muscle in order to provide the platform capacity for brain development. Now, again, that would require separate brain development genes, but it also argues that, of course, you can't get necessarily a massive amount of evolution in your brain capacity if you don't have the ability to also develop and change the size of your brain. And so, uh, again, a nice little example of this. Okay, now in terms of talking about brain genes, uh, the next work was work by Katie Pollard, she's very much a computational biologist. And I think this is where, you know, this was in 2009. And I would think, again, by um, Moore's law, we should have something like 16 times the amount of computing power since, since that time. But this is an example where they took the sequence of, a, of what was known for a wide number of vertebrate animals, again, including chickens, I think macaque, chimpanzee, mouse would have all been available at that time. And, oops, sorry, got him. Ah. And said, let's just look at the sequence and find areas where the human has undergone a lot of these sequence changes compared to all the other ones. And so uh, what she found was particularly an area where there were 13 changes in the humans that only varied by one sequence in all the other organisms. And so, again, as I talked about in the video and we'll talk about uh, in the paper, is that when you look at a lot of these, these areas that have undergone a rapid sequence evolution, that they are either brain development genes or they are in areas that are expected to change the expression level and patterning of brain genes. And so, again, the thing that really kind of separates and uniquely identifies humans compared to um, another species on the planet, at least in the past, say, you know, one to two million years, and even more so in the past, maybe 100,000, is what has, how is our evolutionary capacity evolved? Now, I do want to make a plug here for another PBS series called Becoming Human. And I will just type that in. And maybe Vic, my URL helper guy, can, uh, can look this one up. But Becoming Human explores this topic in much more specificity and also just wonderful little documentary. All right, so any quick questions to cover the specific examples that I talked about and was in what Darwin never knew? So I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, for the rest of the talk. But if there's any sort of science that people want to just have a quick question on or need something clarified, now would be a good time. Thank you, Vic. Yeah, make sure you check out that video if you're still interested in this type of thing. And that one also does mention, as I've mentioned in previous talks, the idea that a part of becoming human was this interbreeding uh, with Neanderthal. They, they come to that at the end. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about what I would say is kind of the rhetorical context of what Darwin never knew. So, of course, Scientists love sharing uh, the things they develop, the new things they know. And, okay, can you everyone hold on a second? All right. My son was getting into practicing the euphonium, man. It was getting louder. All right, so the context of what this video, I think, really is, and this is something you would have probably no reason, and they don't discuss this, right? They don't bring this out. They don't want to make it controversial. Is the, um, 
why, what is this really trying to address in the popularization of evolutionary theory for people broadly? And a part of it is the fact that evolutionary theory is under constant cultural challenge, again, since its inception. If you've seen the, the pictures of Darwin's head on a monkey's, on a chimpanzee's body, or actually, it might have been a monkey, I think it had a tail. You know, this is something that's a very controversial theory. And uh, the reasons why is it contradicts a viewpoint of the world that, that a creator made the universe. Now, if evolution is happening, and yet your religious textbooks are saying, oh, God created and designed and put all this work into it, then that is very contradictory. Uh, the other thing I'll say is uh, it removes, some people feel it removes humankind from a uniqueness pedestal, that's something that is elevated, something that quote unquote has dominion over the earth and the species that are on the earth. And of course, in the end, when it's contradicting what one group is saying, is that it challenges the authority of organized religions that have made claims to history. And I, I want to say very much so that I completely sympathize with this idea for any individual trying to reconcile these two different systems, that there is religion that has told you one way the world is, or at least especially when they're trying to tell you specific things about the way the world is. And then also, again, that scientists through a different methodology are saying, well, this is what the world is, and this is how it came to be. And so um, the one thing, though, and this is I'm a very, making a very narrow, specific um, point here, is that there's a group, the Discovery Institute, and specifically within that umbrella, the Center for Science and Culture, that is tr injecting the idea of intelligent design into the conversation. And the... Um, yeah, Vic, let me come back to that point at the end of the talk, is that they are making a very specific argument to try and reconcile the two to, I think, alleviate people's um, mistrust of the, of, or trying to relieve the, the dichotomy of thinking that they necessarily have with these two, with these two systems. And so I want to specifically say that they are making a lot of arguments in very bad faith and that they are trying to take advantage of people's uncertainty in a way that is, again, a very much a, a false narrative. Okay, so I do want to go back, backtrack a little bit and talk about science in general. And that when we think about science and how science evolves over time, uh, one of the constructs that a philosopher made was Thomas Kuhn talking about the structure of scientific revolutions. And I think that this is a great paradigm for how one thinks about how science evolves. It's not necessarily the entirety of the way we think about it now in terms of the evolution of theories, but it is a good structure in which to talk about. And one of the key components is that when you have a paradigm for how things work, some sort of theory, that you conduct normal science and you keep going until you get something that specifically is called an anomaly. And that is something that theory does not explain, cannot reconcile with what is actually happening, with what the theory says. And so examples of this I have to do with the invention of air, contradicted phlogiston theory, again, the way organisms breathe. Another example is quantum mechanics that explain phenomena at small scales that Newtonian physics cannot explain. Uh, and that is a normal process of science. And the reason why paradigms and theories are maintained is because they have value, accuracy, consistency, and predictive value. And so uh, an anomaly challenges that ability to do that. But what's normal in science is that once an anomaly comes up, you, you question what's different, you try and find some resolution to theory, develop a new paradigm, and then basically you circularly start this over again. You have another new paradigm and you move forward with, again, this new theory. And this is very important to recognize that scientists are skeptics. Scientists naturally have to be skeptics because any sort of paradigm is built upon assumptions, perhaps falsely done experiments, um, again, not by purpose, but by accident. And what goes messy is actually very powerful, but groups like the Center for Science and Learning will actually try and make it seem like it's not a normal process. Okay, so uh, when it comes to what Darwin never knew, and when it comes to evolutionary theory, um, one thing to keep in mind is that 
the failure of, a, of, an, of the evolutionary theory to fully explain a phenomenon is not in and of itself an anomaly. So for example, missing a missing link fossil does not represent an anomaly. It just represents a gap in the theory that the, the, the theory still incorporates and can explain, but it doesn't contradict the theory. And also the idea that mutation rates are insufficient to account for all changes necessary to evolve species is also not an anomaly. That doesn't contradict the way the theory works. It just says there may be, again, either A, a lack of understanding about how mutations work, or maybe mutation rates are not the end all be all of how organisms change. Uh, and then also the appearance of design is not challenged design by natural selection. Again, you can say, oh, I look, look, this looks like it was specifically designed by a creator, but that's not an anomaly. And again, I want to point out that Darwin contradicted these arguments. So it's also, it's very useful as a rhetorician to make yourself sound smart by just ignoring the arguments that you're basically your opponents made. And then finally, uh, design hypothesis also fails in the end to be an accurate, consistent, broad scope, simple, fruitful way of thinking about evolution. So one thing they invoke is that, oh yeah, some microevolution happens, some evolution occurs naturally, but sometimes there's an intervention by a designer. Well, that's not a simple theory. That's actually making it a more complicated way of thinking about how things evolve. And again, the Design Institute also makes some very bad faith arguments. And so this is a quote from a brief scientific history of intelligent design version two by Stephen Meyer, again, one of the quote unquote scientists of the center, is that according to neo-Darwinism, wholly undirected processes such as natural selection and random mutations are fully capable of producing the intricate design-like structures in living systems. And he says, key point here is according to neo-Darwinism. Now, neo is a you know, root word meaning new. And so to any sort of unfamiliar reader, you say, oh, this is new Darwinism. This must be current theory. That is also a false narrative. Neo-Darwinism is basically, I have the whole quote here, but I'll just say it's combining Mendelian genetics with Darwinian evolutionary theory. And this was back in the 1930s. That was this genesis was the 1930s. So this is not the current way that evolution actually thinks and works. Uh, so, but I think if you're using the term neo-Darwinism and you're using that purposely, you're either A, really ignorant of the way evolution is thought of by, right now, or you're trying to make a purposely misleading argument. Uh, there's another example, we're again taken from the same document, uh, where uh, Meyer quotes Stephen Jay Gould, where he says, the neo-Darwinism synthesis is effectively dead, despite its continued presence as textbook orthodoxy. And that sounds pretty bad, right? That's saying, oh man, this theory is considered dead, and people still want to believe it. Um, but of course, if you actually go back, and I'm just drawing a quote from the abstract of a paper by Gould. I have not, and again, I'm familiar with Gould's work, but uh, not highly read on this particular topic. But he was just saying that this idea of gradual allele change leading to adaptations that occur with natural selection, well, nobody believes it anymore. Scientists don't believe that anymore. We have other ways to explain rapid genetic change. Again, something that Gould was associated with, or basically proposed, was punctuated equilibrium. Again, rapid evolution uh, within geologic time spans, which again is something that contradicts what was the strict interpretation of neo-Darwinism. And so I feel like you know Stephen Meyer is making this very specific argument, saying that Gould is saying one thing. But it's actually saying something, Gould was saying something completely different. That is within the way paradigms evolve. The way the evolutionary theory has evolved is exactly what Gould is doing. And Meyer's attacking that process to make it sound like, you know, scientists are lying to people and not, not changing what they think. Uh, I do want to just give one really good example of how neo-Darwinism, and even Gould himself was very skeptical of a theory proposed by Lynn Margulis. Again, Lynn Margulis, uh, at the time she was married to Carl Sagan. So the first, uh, the authorship on the paper on the origin of mitosing cells, it says Sagan was actually, uh, once they got divorced, she changed her name. Or I think she got remarried to somebody named Margulis. And this is something known as the endosymbiotic theory, where the 
presence of mitochondria, again, this is actually harkening back to another recent science uh, circle talk with uh, Max Chatnoir, talking about mitochondria, that mitochondria basically were an, an independent organism that somehow inhabited a eukaryote, and then basically they became this symbiotic relationship where the mitochondria produce energy, and the cell uses that energy but provides a house to the mitochondria. And then this actually happened again with chloroplasts. So all the plants that are photosynthetic on the, or on the planet are due to the merging of yet another organism into this pre-existing eukaryote. Again, how does this contradict the basic tenets of Darwinian theory? It's the, Darwinian theory, like I said before, strictly would say uh, identity by descent. Well, again, this is an example where the descent is actually a merging of two completely separate organisms. And actually, modern biology has found more examples of these types of relationships. They're very rare and niche. But when you think about the vast majority of the biology that we do and the organisms that we are familiar with, and we ourselves, we are due to what is a non-Darwinian evolution. Now, do biologists turn around and say, oh, well, this contradicts Darwinian evolution, so it must have been a designer? No. It just says, let's re- design the theory, let's reiterate and say, what is a modern evolutionary theory? And that's what we have right now. And anytime you see um, proponent, or, uh, yeah, yeah, proponents of evolution saying, oh, neo-Darwinism, neo-Darwinism, well, biologists have moved beyond neo-Darwinism and they need to move beyond that argument as well. Um, let me say also that as a, as a microbiologist, I gave myself a challenge this morning, of, even though I was very tired, I said, how many examples of non-Darwinian evolution can I come up with in 10 minutes? And so here's just a long listing of things that would all be really great examples of um, things that you could write documentary, that you know, you have a, a PBS series that talks about all these different examples where modern microbiology has said, wow, these are things that do not follow the way we textbook and from a Darwinian time view think of evolution. And this is, again, the importance of understanding that the, the process and evolution of science and scientific theories incorporates new information and says, well, let's try and understand this, understand how it affects our understanding of the biology, not then throw up our hands and say, oh, someone must have made it that way. So this ends my talk. And a little bit of, again, both trying to talk about, um, from a common basis, the understanding of modern evolutionary theory through what Darwin never knew. And again, that's an almost 10-year-old documentary, so there's a lot more that's happened since then. And then also try and impart some of the idea of where that documentary fits, I think, into this larger cultural phenomenon of um, people attacking evolutionary theory. All right. Um, any questions? Wow. Thank you. It's always great to hear the applause sound. Um, SR asks, are we aliens? Um, you know, there, there's this, there's this theory called panspermia. And I like that, actually, actually, maybe the context of what you're asking the question is, you know, the Design Institute actually, as a part of their argument, says we're not invoking that a designer necessarily um, is God. It actually could have been aliens. They actually do say this. And I think anybody who's seen, um, oh, shoot, I'm blank on the movie, uh, it was based, the same universe as Aliens, but the progenitors, um, ah, it just came out. That was a good movie. Um, you know, maybe there are, maybe there are other things. Uh, so, but those are really kind of, for most of what the panspermia people argue is that that is something that may address some of the very early origins of life on the planet, because there's not any sort of example of an, if you, you know, sequence aliens, if you were to sequence people, we keep finding the fact that as we sequence more organisms, they all have this common ancestry. There's not been anything to contradict the origin of DNA uh, since 
what we can since the earliest organisms that we can sequence and recognize in the fossil record. So, you know, I, I, we're not we're not aliens in that sense. Lysenkoism uh, is that something related? Is that something related to um, uh, Lamarckism? I would have to look that one up to know what you mean by it. And this is a question from Ariane. Ariana. Let me do a quick search to remind myself of what Sankism is. Oh, yes, uh, the Soviets and his authorities and all. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, he was someone who, yeah, kind of prescribed to a uh, more Lamarckian way of thinking about biology. And there is just not much to support what he did. And I think also people look back at his work and found that there was a lot of fraud in actually the way he develops his initial data experiments to argue that you could direct um, that. And in fact, there's even a more social argument that Lysenkism was used by the Soviet party as an excuse to actually purposely starve people. So, um, you know, I will say that in terms of evolutionary biology, there's not there's not much that people who believe in Lysenkism. Although again, like a lot of theories, like even like Lamarckism, you can find these like very niche examples of a biological process that resembles something that you know these these um, non-canonical people had examples of. It's like epigenetics is this example of Lamarckism in a sense. Um, yeah, so the modern human evolutionary, the, the rates of it is something that people do find pretty phenomenally fast. Uh, but one thing about it, and this is something that does fit with punctuated equilibrium. I'm sorry, I'm addressing a question from uh, SR again, that if you watch the video Becoming Human, one thing that was very clear that we know from the ge geological record of Africa over the past four million years is that there was a dramatic amount of geological climate upheaval, just constant. That it the evolution, the, the rapidity of human evolution could actually be explained by these population expansions and then constrictions to small numbers because of these just constant ecological pressures. And the other thing that you know Darwinian evolution doesn't talk about too much, but there is some examples in, in um you know, modern evolutionary theory, an adaptation that allows higher mutation rates, or maybe to some degree, some higher frequency mutations in, in certain types of sequences is certainly possible. And so you're not necessarily directing um, a type of sequence. But again, let me just let me just hypothesize, and this is not something I know, but I'm giving you an example, that let's say you create a mutator phenotype that recognizes the common sequence of human brain gene switches, right? That if human brain evolution was under a lot of pressure to evolve quickly, then you could have imagined an evolved mechanism that allows you to evolve more quickly. And that is perfectly fitting within a modern evolutionary theory. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question, SR? I, again, I'm not proposing that someone's found it, but that would be a hypothesis one could, could think about or, or do, especially now that we have genome sequences of lots of people. Um, you can start asking that question. Yeah, isolation and then rapid expansion. Again, that's one thing. Humans are relatively unique in that one thing that our brain power and culture allows us to do is to overcome what are the most common environmental limits. So agriculture, right? Agri the invention of agriculture completely changed the carrying capacity of environments for humans. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, great, great. Be looking forward to that talk, Mike. Um, were there any questions that were in the chat earlier that people would like for me to address? Anything that you kind of flagged as something that um, that I could kind of address?
let's see. Yeah, comparing Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal Man, I think the problem with Cro-Magnon is I, we have not, for a while, there was a Spanish population that claimed they had ancestry back to Cro-Magnon, but I'm not, it's not clear that there are any living known ancestors where we can do the comparative genomics. Oh, I know, somebody mentioned the Denisovans uh, earlier. Yeah, the Basques, that's right. Thank you, Aurora. Uh, but my understanding is that when people have, when scientists have looked at the sequences of Basque, there, there's not support for the fact that somehow they are a branch of Cro-Magnon. Uh, again, not something I am intimately familiar with, but that's my understanding. Oh, okay, so as I was talking about like the fossil record of Cro-Magnon, um, I am, no, no, so let me just say, I, so tagline, as far as I know, there's not scientific evidence to support that the Basque are in fact Cro-Magnon. They do have a slightly different, I think, language branch, but I'm not, the, the genetics does not support that idea. Yeah, but there, I think that's the thing too. Aurora points out that yeah, their their la language doesn't fit into the, the Indo-European, but you know there are other explanations for why that could be. Um, yeah, so Denisovans, I mean, there's there's a genome sequence based on a thumb bone, and I would have to go back and look. I, I think they're not a branch of Neanderthal. I thought the Denisovans actually had a a much later common ancestor. Again, don't quote me on that. I don't think. Um, um, but I don't know that we have necessarily a lot of examples of Denisovan genomes to be able to make a lot of good comparisons. Um, so Ariana says, you know, mentions the Basques. I, again, I think one thing to point out is that when people want to make a case that they are unique and independent, that there may be political motivations for that. Uh, so Susan G asks, could humans be genetically engineered to regrow gills? You know, I think, you know, this is one of the, the, the funny parts of evolution is that, yeah, in a sense, we probably could be. We could probably find a way to stop the block of gill development becoming inner ears. But one, you'd probably have deaf people who now have gills. Uh, and the fact that you have gill slits doesn't necessarily mean you have all the capillary bed structures that allow gills to act like gills, right? And so, you know, once evolution has moved on, um, it's, you, you also have to have all the supporting structures at the same time. Well, again, if, if you want gill slits, I think one could engineer gill slits. Um, in humans, if that's if that's what you really want. Um, well, okay, so swimming like a fish, you know, one thing you that you know the, the the webbing that people have between their fingers is something that you know is something. It's actually a webbing that's made between fingers, and there are examples of people who have webbing because the genes that cause that degradation in between fingers goes away. So we could probably find a way to change and keep, you know, more more webbing so you could become a more efficient swimmer. I don't know, one day we'll probably have some Olympic athlete who has that from a genetic condition. People will argue about whether he or she should be allowed to swim and compete. So uh, Tuya uh, mentions a good question. So when looking at phylogenetic changes, we need to extend our view to how systems are interlinked. Muscle contraction equals can lead to more bone growth, can lead to more brain tissue expansion, and can lead to intelligence. And I think that that is, this integrated view is something that is very important. Yeah, totally. That's totally exactly uh, how you want to look at it. You know, one thing that's also, when you think about bone growth, like how many people here have had their wisdom teeth removed, right? And I had an impacted one that, it, you know, bad enough, it probably could have killed me from an infection, right? If it had been 20,000 years ago. And so, you know, the fact that we 
But there are some people who actually don't even develop their, those last wisdom teeth. So they don't even have to worry about whether they do or don't fit in their mouths. And I think that, um, you know, organisms have to compensate uh, for changes and that these typically do have to have some degree of being gradual. And that anytime you have mutations, uh, there are other things that have to occur, but they are related, right? That the ability to have enough mouth space that if your cells are responsive to tissue-based signals that say, oh, make teeth here because we have a big jaw, well, if you have one mutation that says don't make a big jaw, then you naturally don't try and make all those same teeth if you have these, yeah, these integrative interactive uh, body plan systems. Uh, SR asks, is that Maya or Indus or European or Babylonian all have some common factors? Do you mean genetic factors or language factors, or do you have something specific in mind? Uh, again, there's a lot of great demographic work being done with human variation. I am not familiar with all of it. I'm not familiar with all of it. Oh, um, yeah, you know, I so there's some great documentaries that talk about people who are convinced that they are the result of an alien impregnating their mother. And the thing is, I've not known any of these people to ever undergo genetic sequencing because genetic sequencing would tell you where you got your DNA. And so there's just, you know, no support from sequencing genomes that says, oh, we are some sort of hybrid of very disparate species, or again, even very disparate you know, groups and families of organisms. Oh, Douglas Adams quote, yeah, proof denies faith and without faith I am nothing. Yeah, I think that's an interesting argument that you see sometimes from you know, the creationism, intelligent design adherence is that they want to say, oh, if you don't have religion, how can you have morality, right? How can society and humankind even exist and, and grow and be anything if you don't have religion to give you morality? And I think, you know, you, you don't need morality to survive. And if your morality is based upon religions and books telling you what to do that's very specific, I'm not sure what the value per se of all that morality is if you need a book to tell you, oh, don't kill somebody else. Um, I actually gave a talk one time saying that biology can be the basis of a moral theory. Uh, that was a little while ago. You can probably find it on YouTube. Wait, sorry. So let me see. Um... Sorry. Uh... Yeah, I mean, the amazing stuff you can do with DNA testing is pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, so there's a few mentions that studies find that atheists are just as moral as theists. I, I totally believe that. I mean, there's a lot of evolutionary pressure. Actually, there have been some really great papers published on the development of altruism, that if you actually do modeling of populations, that altruistic behavior of behaving well and good to other people actually has a, a survival advantage. It's like, you know, the herd mentality. I mean, well, to some degree, it's like this a parallel way of thinking that herds are very powerful evolutionary structures because, yeah, weak people, individuals get killed, but more people, more individuals in, in a population survive because you exist within a herd. And this type of altruistic or other moral behavior supports the idea that humans have the advantages to survival from having certain types of moral structures. Uh, Null Subset asks about natural human altruism with rigid social and political structure. And good questions. Again, a little bit beyond what I want to get into, other than saying that there are some genetic bases for potential bases for how altruism is a kind of brain behavior set point. All right, so we're hitting, um, let's see, 9.15. So I don't want to um, have anybody feel like they need to stay or that this is a continuing 
and I, I really am limited in my time coming as well. Um, so, yeah, feel free to pop out. I'm so glad. I'm glad so many people came to make it. <laughs> I am. I am not leaving because I'm being dragged to church. I will certainly put it that way. Yeah, I'm glad people came and asked in, uh, relevant questions. Again, I, I can't necessarily, with the timing of what I prepare, address every question in local chat. But uh, you can always come back and ask me with a text message or a note card later. Um, oh, you know, okay, so this is actually, sorry, I will say one last thing. You know, when we think about individuals within populations that are variants that, you know, from a moral standpoint or societal standpoint, you might say are deviants. You know, one thing to keep in mind is that variation is a natural thing that we have to have within evolution to survive as a species. And if you actually, I talked about, if you go back and look at my racism talk, you'll talk, I'll talk about that more extensively. But, you know, there, that nobody, no biologist believes that individuals are completely patterned by their genes and that there aren't influences in development and culture and behavior that happen. But the idea that you can have individuals that have very low empathy, which is something that's associated with psychopathy, that could also be due to genetics, you know, there actually may have been a time where some of that was advantageous within a small number of individuals for survival in a pre-society time. But it also could just be random variation that these are genes that exist, and they, they just kind of do. Glad you came, Mike. Mike, have a good day. All right, let me go back to the home page. All right. Yes, have a good day, everyone. All right, and I have, I have a, two minutes. Maybe I can address one last question. Yeah, Aurora mentions this idea about psychopaths are actually terrible people. And again, people can have psychopathy, but it doesn't necessarily mean they harm anybody. It really represents a lack of empathy. And of course, <laughs> uh, there was a study done, and I again, I, I'm not a sociologist, but they actually looked at the frequency of so sociopathic tendencies within business people. And they found that there seems to be within executives and business people a higher prevalence of psychopathy traits. And that may have to do with people, again, being willing to be more aggressive in trading practices or starting businesses or firing people or merging companies where they actually lacked some degree of empathy for how, you know, companies and these money exchanges affect workers and people. So, you know, if you can say that that's been an important economic driver for the United States, then there is some degree of value to that. Oh, are, yeah, so you're talking about like the studies where they had people play Monopoly? Because those are awesome. Yeah, I love the uh, again something to look up on online. I'm not I'm not going to address it, but I think because especially that's one where there seems to be a lot more. That's more of a behavioral cultural patterning than something related to genes. Well, yeah, I think game based studies that are especially that are observational, but. It's a tough methodology. You don't have the same thing like molecular biology of injecting a lax Z gene in somebody. But I do feel it's come a long way in terms of the way they code and quantify things and use more relevant statistics to actually examine. Oh, so the monopoly study I'm talking about is one where, I don't know if you've seen it, Aurora, but they had two people in a room and they let one person only roll one die and they earned less money somehow also. And then the other person got the two, they played the game normally where they got two dice and they basically always earned the $200 every time they pass go. And the actual social behavior patterning between how that changed, the way the person interacted with the other one and how much they thought that they were winning games because of skill. Like they would ask them, well, how did you win the game? Like I was a better player. It's like, even though you started off with all these huge advantages inherently, you know, so it was, it was kind of, 
I, I don't want to overinterpret and say that these are fact and true, but I think there's enough well-developed science to at least have that conversation. Yeah, so Berrigan mentions that too, like psychopathy and advantage side. It's it's entirely reasonable. I don't know, and I don't know about the studies, but you know, we don't necessarily have an easy way to measure in an objective fashion, say via MRIs or genes, that someone is a psychopath. It's also very based on data acquisition that has a lot of you know fuzziness to it. That's right. That's good. Country clubs are, are a place to observe that, over, which makes me want to go watch Caddyshack again. Caddyshack. Oh, I'm sorry, that text went too fast. Okay, last one. This is definitely the last thing I'm going to do. Okay, so Stranger Nightfire mentions perhaps psychopathy could have been more useful in some way before we had things like biological and nuclear weapons and the like. And yeah, that's a actually perfectly good contextual example that people who are psychopathic, you know, the scale at which they could, you know, eliminate people from the gene pool is um, was very small scale. And the fact that we now have kind of a, a Lamarckian type of evolution when it comes to our technology, the scale at which psychopaths can uh, can behave is very. So someone mentioned Stalin earlier. I don't know if Stalin was a psychopath, but certainly had a wide scale effect on on populations as well as Hitler. Okay, and with that, I think I think I'm going to um, teleport out of here. Uh, Chantal, thank you for the opportunity to talk and organizing, and Jess and Hades, thank you for recording. Uh, do you want me to take my stuff, or do you want to just return it later? Thank you for coming, Aurora. Yeah, yeah, just return it later. That'll be fine. That way people can see what the talk was. And again, don't forget, oh, say, Chantel, can you send out a note card that has the landmark for the PGS, for the Population Genetic Simulator? I think that would be something for people to check out. But again, it's also available at Genome and some other places. Glad you made it, Franz. Didn't, didn't even notice you in the locality. All right, I'm gonna TP out of here. Thank you all for coming. Have a good day or night or evening and um, or morning or middle of the night. All that. Ciao.